This morning's lesson is fitting with last week. Last week we talked about baseball, or t-ball really. And then we're talking about how Christianity is meant to be difficult. This week we want to talk about how Christianity has a second part that's just as hard. And it's sorrow. And then when I think about the sorrow of Christianity... I always go back to Jeremiah and that concept of, you know, God working on us and, you know, just chipping away at us. And, you know, trying to design us to be something. Because as neat as this piece of wood is, how many of y'all are going to pick it up and go, yeah, I'm going to put that on my table? I'm going to have some of y'all would actually, wouldn't you? <laughs> That's what's getting funny. But, but you understand that, honestly, to use this piece of wood, I'm, I'm going to first, I'm going to need to strip this piece of wood down. You need, you need to see the wood. You don't need to see this nasty bark. You want to see that wood underneath. You want to see that skin that's underneath. You don't want to see all these blemishes. You don't want to see all these imperfections. When you look at this, you want to see a piece of wood that's something that you want to put on your table. That's something you want to put on your front porch. You know, it needs to be painted or it needs to be shaped. But the problem with shaping this wood is, do you see the tools I'm using? I mean, how many of y'all have seen me coming with these and you're like, yeah, this is a good idea. <laughs> I'm imagining like Friday the 13th, ah, okay, uh. right? But, but when God comes at us, it's very similar. In the, in the, in the story of the potter and the clay, he's just making it and then it becomes something he says, I'm just completely remaking. And it's one thing when we're talking about wood or clay. It's a whole other thing when we're talking about people. And we're trying to chip away that outside. And if you think about where Christianity begins, it begins with this idea of extreme sorrow. Because until we realize that we need all that sin, all that sickness, all that disease that we have chipped away, to reveal something much, much nicer. I mean, I admit, how many of y'all think this is actually nicer right here? <laughs> this wood underneath. And how many of y'all think that though I'm using a chisel on a piece of wood, I'm not destroying it? I'm not taking something and as though this wood were alive. It's not going to want me to hit it, right? None of y'all want me to come at you with a chisel. Right? Is that fair? Okay. You're like, you're tiny. I can take you. <laughs> what a smell, too. But the truth is, when you see this, and you start to see it shaping, you can understand that I'm in that beautiful grain. I'm revealing something underneath that so much better than just an old pine tree that got cut down and just has been sitting there for months. You're starting to see how this could become something and be something greater. And I think about this sorrow, about how being chosen by God is terrible. I, I think about the very first person I can think of that relates to Christ, and the very first one, and there, he goes to her and says, you're going to carry Jesus. Wow, wow, God, you get to be the very vessel of Jesus. Now imagine being this unwed mother who's engaged to be married and an angel has to come just to convince your husband that you aren't what everybody thinks you are. And, and the angel doesn't appear to everybody and go, she is not what you think she is. I know she looks like she got pregnant before she got married. I know you can do the math. And, and I know she, what she looks like and I know what it looks like she did. The angel doesn't walk around doing that. We have this Teenage mother who must face the world, and she's got to face extreme sorrow. She may be the chosen vessel, but being the chosen vessel of Jesus was hard. And we are the chosen vessel of the Holy Spirit. But it is no less hard. Let's begin 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 1. 
Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Make room for us in your hearts. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. And do not speak to condemn you. For I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am overflowing with joy in all our affliction. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were afflicted on every side. Conflicts without, fears within. But God who comforts the depressed comforts us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you. As he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice even more. In verse 8 he continues, he says, For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it for a little while. For I see that the letter has caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. How terrible an idea that you say you begin in a position, and the position we begin when we tell the gospel is this, I need you to understand you are unworthy. The, the very first step in presenting Christianity is to say, I would like to make something nice of you. God would like to take you, mold you, make you into his holy temple and use you. But I have to start by saying that you're unworthy. I, I got to start by convincing you that you are so sinful that it doesn't make sense. That you are so wicked that you're just a lump of wood lying on the side of the road. But yet, in the first slide, I had a picture of a dugout. It's where you take an old piece of wood, and it needs to be old, and it needs to be aged, and it needs to be hardened by the weather. Beat down, worthless, should be cast aside. And then what you do is you chip away at it. And then you put hot coals in it to harden it some more. And then you chip away at it, and then you hot coals and harden it some more. And it takes days to do this. And, and what you're left with is you've taken this piece of wood that's Literally, driftwood, it's discarded. And, and you have this boat that will last for hundreds of years. Now, if you take a beautiful tree outside, you cut it down, and you make a boat, it won't last that long. At some point, you know, nature will happen, and it'll deteriorate, and it'll go away. But what God does is he takes something and he says, let me find something as bad as that driftwood. Let me say something that knows that they should be sorrowful. And let me take that and build a boat out of that instead. And then that boat, 200 years from now, is in museums. We have museums of 200-year-old boats because they took old wood, wood that was trapped. <laughs> and they built over time with a chisel, with fire. And then they cleaned it out and hollowed it out and they have this dug out there. And who knows how long they're going to last. We have many of them remaining because of the simple fact God is taking something from a position of realizing its worthlessness and making it something better than if it had started with that. Then if it had started, it was nice and new. And God tells us that all have sinned. But yet, that sorrow has been so separated because what we do is we say, everybody sins. There's no need for sorrow. Anymore. Everybody sins, you know, my sins aren't as bad as, you know, Charlie's sins. My sins aren't as bad as, you know, Jesse's sins. Well, you know, I, I'm not perfect, but God really doesn't expect that. That's a lie. One of the only times that 
People get confused is when God says that we have to be perfect. And we go, oh, he's just being figurative. He doesn't really mean that. I mean, it's not like he's God or anything and he just says what he means. But he, does, he doesn't say, I want you to be good. He says, I want you to be perfect. God doesn't say, I'd like you to be nice. He says, perfect, perfect, perfect. And we come to him and we say, I am imperfect. But yet, when we talk about salvation, until we figure out we're imperfect, nobody's wielding a chisel on me. If you don't convince me something is wrong, I will not let you cut me. Just a general rule here. Don't cut me. But if I go in for surgery, I don't go, yeah, they cut me up. I'm sure it'll help somehow. I go, tell me exactly what is wrong with me. Tell me how it will help, what I'm going to face, how bad will it hurt. And if I don't start in the position where I go, hey, I need this. Then the first time God starts chiseling away at me, I'm going to run. When God really starts to strip away what is on the outside, that, that bark on the outside that we have, and says, I want you to be real. Because this, this is nicer than this. But this isn't still something you put on your table. You, you wouldn't say, now that the bark is removed, it's perfect. You want the finished product. You, you want to see the end results in the middle. We all do. We, we don't want to work on something and be like, well, in two days I'm going to have what I want. We want to go, do 30 seconds, done. Did you see that? That was gorgeous. And the reality is when God's working on us, sometimes this is what it looks like. Different layers being chipped away. And, and, and what we do is we lie about it. Instead of being honest and saying, well, God is working on me. I'm imperfect. I still need y'all praying for me. I still need the church. I need people I can come to when I'm struggling. We say, hey, I've got it, I've got it polished. I'm looking nice. And instead of viewing us as that nice, polished individual, we do a lot better to think of ourselves as lumberjacks. Lumberjacks, they're, you know, they're perfect examples of society, right? You go out there, you don't bathe for a week, and you stink, and you smell, and you work all day, and you generally don't talk to people, and you're a little rough, and you're a little coarse, everything's calloused. You know, you're polished neat. And if we consider ourselves that way, we get a better idea. And, but the opposite is what's really happening. If we consider ourselves those, that tree, we consider ourselves that pottery that God is working through, and he says, through sorrow, I'm working on you. He begins in verse 1, and he says that we need to be pure. We need to be cleansed from all defilement. But that's going to take a whole change of us. Because if I come into a church and I see a bunch of perfect people, why would I go in? I'm not one of them. If I go into a church and all I see is perfect people, I'm not one of them. If I go into a church and I see people that are honest and they're like, hey, can you pray for me? I'm struggling. But, but I, I, I've you know, tried to tally up you know, within the past three months since January. I was trying to see how many people made requests that were spiritual in nature. Less than a tenth. This, this is what the church looks like. It looks like this. You come together and you say, hey, somebody's sick. Somebody's, somebody's died. Somebody's this, this, this. And we do a really good job of trying to work on that flesh. That fleshly love. But, but when he says, remove the defilement of the spirit. Whoa. But we don't get that a lot. We don't get where we're honest with each other. And we go, you know what? I'm a real person. I'm not a finished piece of wood. I'm, I'm probably not this far along. I still got bark stuck on me. And we come and we say, God, I am really as bad as you say I am. I am, I am that wickedness that you go to the cross for. I am 
that wickedness that you cannot be in the presence of. I am not what I make myself out to be. We love our coats and our barks and our skins and everything else. But it's not how any of Christianity worked. Paul becomes this great evangelist in the church. Because he probably figured out the first step pretty easily. I mean, he is killing people, fighting against God, dragging them into prison. Yeah. Teaching against Jesus. I don't know. What, what do we got? We got false teaching, murdering. Those are big ones on our list. Um, we probably shouldn't wrongfully imprison people. Kidnapping's bad. I got it. And we've got our list of things that are really bad. And we're like, Paul, you've done those. You can actually figure out that you're bad. And when two people come to him, and he looks at them, and he sees a prostitute, and he sees a teacher of the law, and he starts talking about that kind of love. How much love is there? How much desire to serve God is there? He's like, can you see how much they desire to serve God? Isn't that prostitute a great example? No, we would love to make Christianity back to the other. Where those who look nice are nice. Those who look like the lawyers, the Pharisees, the scribes, they are the ones we should look at. And the reality is, those who are most broken are the best examples. I still remember to this day, I had this sweet lady named Polly. It's either Paul or Polly. One's her nickname, I don't remember which one. We could not get along to save our lives. If she said it was blue, I said it was red. I mean, it was pretty clear cut. We did not agree on anything. And I went, oh, for the first while, every time I preach, she's like, you know that we don't do that. Our tradition states. And I was like, the Bible says it. She's like, tradition, Bible, tradition, Bible. Back and forth. And we had this terrible relationship for, well, at least six months. And then she did something, and I was so impressed. There was this youth minister there. Obviously, tradition, youth minister, they don't really fit that well together. And they got into an argument. And, and it became a scene. And people saw it. And, and, and you know, you had your two sides. You had your legalists and your literalists, and, you know, they're, they're going at it. And, and you're just like, well, this is going to tear the church apart. That's how it's going to work. I've seen this before. Let's get it on. Next Sunday, before anything can be done, she comes forward. She, she's traditional. She's protecting her traditional values. She is being true to her roots. But she goes forward. And the way she said it, she goes, I'm just as sinful as they are. I'm no better than they are. We shouldn't be fighting. We're on the same level. <clears throat> I was like, and, and to me, trying to grasp that. Try, trying to grasp a church that looked like that. A church where we were honest and we didn't say, oh, they're, they're doing that. We instead said, well, you know, I'm trying to be better than that. But honestly, let, let's, let's keep our measuring rod where it is. Let's keep our measuring rod at Christ and then say, well, we're on the same level. You're at 0 .01 and I'm at 0 .0098. Okay. A lot closer than 100%. But he continues in verse 11 with this. For behold, what earnestness, this very thing, this godly sorrow. Look how proud of it. He loves it. Godly sorrow. Doesn't that just sound beautiful? For we all want earnestness, this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything, you demonstrate yourselves to be innocent in the matter. We're still talking about godly sorrow here. So although I wrote... 
to you. It was not for the sake of the offender, nor for the sake of one offended, but that your earnestness on our behalf might be made known to you in the sight of God. For this reason, we have been comforted. And besides our comfort, we rejoice even much more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I boasted him about you, I was not to put to shame. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, so also our boasting before Titus proved to be the truth. His affection abounds all the more towards you as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice that in everything I have confidence in you. That was all about godly sorrow. If you walk into a church and you say, I want to define the health of this church, it's a broken church. I got a good church there. Did you hear it? I'm, I'm going to go send my friends over there so they can check it out. This, this, this is what I'm working with. I don't know what you have to face every Sunday, but this is what I have to face. I have to face a congregation that is broken down with sorrow. Go check them out. That's godliness. That's fighting evil. That's demonstrating the power of God. Not standing up there being fancy. Not saying I got it all together. Saying, you know what, I, I'd like some prayers. Coming through and saying, you know, there's actually real things that I'm struggling with. But I don't want to play the hypocrite today, so I'm going to be fair with you. I've been struggling with God. Oh, it's true. I, I don't understand how God can let Shana get pregnant and then her lose it. And, and right when it was on, it was all in the moment. And in the moment, I'm great. I love Christ. And I just get hyper, and then I don't even notice what's going on. But after things calm down, I start to think about things. And I say, God, why would you do that? Okay, are you, are you going to say I'm a terrible person because I'm struggling with God? And it's not that I struggle with existence. I know it exists. The world exists. There has to be a creator. Blah, blah, blah. I got that part. I just struggle with why sometimes. And if you don't, you're probably lying. And if you don't, and you're not lying, you probably are suffering somewhere else. And the truth is, does anybody around you know? I meant to say, I don't know, but I did. I was ready to preach against y'all. And I was like, oh, junk. I love when I try to do that. Because I just find a mirror and it works a whole lot better than preaching against y'all. I say, who knew that? And I'll tell you, she's none of y'all knew that. And, and we're not just talking about coming forward or requesting prayers. We're talking about one another. You've got three godly men that, honestly, I didn't, one of them should have known. One of them, I should have gone to. I said, can you just pray for me right now? Mm -hmm. I did. I did. What did I do? I, I, I look like this. I am 100% honest with you right now. That's exactly what I look like. I have that skin. I want to be the preacher that y'all want me to be. Blah, 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 blah. I can justify all day long. Or I can tell you this. Too many of us have stuff we're struggling with. Too many of us have stuff and we need that sense of sorrow, that repentance. But we cover it up. Instead of just going and telling each other, hey, can you pray for me? Because if we are so convinced that we can do it on our own, Jesus is pointless. Jesus only works when we say, God, I give up. I repent. So today we have an invitation, and our invitation is simple. But it starts with... The very first part here. You can read it. You know Acts 2.38. But I don't want you to focus on 38. I want you to focus. Four little words. It all begins with God this time. And saying, God, I don't think I'm on your level. I don't think I'm where you want me to be. I know that you wanted perfection and you got me. I, I was at clay in your hand and I'm mush right now. Can you build me back up to something? 
and they were pierced to the heart. And today, that, that is our invitation. It's, it's the invitation to believe that Jesus is Lord and respond to that to say, I'm not what you want me to be. Repenting of our sins, confessing Jesus as Lord, being baptized so that we can be raised up something we are not worthy of. That we can then live for Him and gain an entrance into heaven where you must be perfect to enter. But through Christ, we have that entrance. If there's anybody who needs to respond to that invitation, or you need prayers, or you wish to submit to the eldership here, we ask you to come now as we stand and as we sing. Oh, to Jesus.